A company's job is to screw you, our job is to screw them back. Martin Lewis is on a mission to change the way you think. No one's actually that interested in money stuff, but they're interested in their money stuff. There was one bank account, I think it was Barclays. They were paying people a hundred quid to sign up for a bit. I said, everybody go and do this. And we closed that bank account in three hours. You cannot market trust. Trust only comes from being trustworthy. I had three people in a week call me a god. I, was, I couldn't cope with it. It absolutely broke me. I just, I couldn't breathe. What ignites that anger to want to put yourself out there and challenge the system? When a struggling 90-year-old grandmother with onset dementia is paying the maximum for her energy bills because she can't access the system and doesn't understand what to do, that is criminal. And you sit there going, well, someone, someone has to do something. Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Listen, before we get going, I just wanted to drop in and say a huge thanks to all of our new subscribers. This channel is growing like crazy. And here's the truth, okay? The more subscribers we get, the bigger the channel becomes. The bigger it becomes, the greater the names that we can attract. So before you watch this video, please just spend five seconds hitting subscribe. It's good for us, but it's also great for you and it really helps grow this channel. Thank you so much and enjoy. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Somewhat nervous. Why? Always more comfortable talking as the money-saving expert rather than talking as me. Yeah. This is a little bit more intimate than what I'm used to. So I'm a, you know, wondering where you're going to go with it. But you realise and understand, don't you, that you've lived a very interesting life, experienced a lot of things, and that carries a real value for people. I hope so. I hope some of it will be useful. Some of it is personal, and some of it, and, and I'm not sure how much of anyone's individual experience can resonate across to, to lots of people. But I think there are some common learnings, yes, I'm sure. Great. Well, let's start as we always do then. What in your mind is high performance? So for me, high performance is getting it right, have people listening to you and having impact. That's where I am in, in, in this stage of my life at the moment. So one, one of the things that I try and do in everything is, you know, I, I talk to my team uh, when we're writing something and I explain to them, that we must always consider that anybody reading or watching is selfish, not in a pejorative way of selfishness, uh, but in the idea that no one's actually that interested in money stuff, but they're interested in their money stuff. So for me, high performance is getting people to do things that improve their lives and, and also trying to get policymakers and regulators to do things that improve their lives at the same time. And achieving that would be, it would be my definition of where I am right now of high performance. So where did you learn that, that trick about talking to the individual, not talking to the masses? I made it up. Did you? Most of what I did was made up. Uh, and, and look, after university, I worked in city PR, and then I trained, uh, got a postgrad in broadcast journalism. I am a journalist by trade, very proudly a journalist, a broadcast journalist by trade. But then I came up with the concept of money saving uh, on a very tiny little telly channel in uh, around 2000. I'd worked at the BBC in uh, business and personal finance journalism. I went there and uh, there was this opportunity. I was one of five broadcast journalists hired. All the rest had much more on air experience from me, but I was the only one who knew my ISA from my elbow because I'd worked in personal finance. So they offered me after a while, they said, we've got this little program, deal of the day. Um, it's, we want you to do one minute, we want you to do top deals, and, and originally they wanted to be like holiday deals, and I was just like, I'm not interested in that, but how about I do real research into what the best consumer finance products are, and they went, well, I said, I'll tell people what best deals are on lots of stuff. So they said, all right, try it. So this was a channel that ran for three hours, and then they repeated it eight times. Um, so my one minute was originally one minute in the first hour, and then it was one minute every hour, and by the time that channel went bust, um, it was uh, 10 minutes every hour. And it was sort of the mainstay and I'd built this little web platform and I'd worked it and I'd used all of that to really build the research that went on. And what had been going on before in, in my world of personal finance journalism? Well, there'd been Alvin Hall had been around, who some people may remember, who was very much a stop spending expert. Whereas I am a uh, how to play the system, how it works, make sure you understand it, embrace the complexity. That's always, especially in the early days, that was my motto, it's complex, so let's embrace that and turn it back on them. And that was what turned me on then. I, more, now more it's about the, the consumer campaigning. And, and so 
I did that and I built that and I had to make it all up. I never read anybody else's books. I still don't look at other websites. So to try not to take ideas that are coming elsewhere. And when I first set up the website, if you're talking about where it all came from, I remember I spoke to a, a good friend of mine who dines out on this now because he's in that industry about the site. And he said, oh, you've got two things wrong. I said, what have I got wrong? He said, first of all, nobody wants to see a face on the front of a money website. You know, th these are meant to be professional. No, right. And I was like, but I think people want to see the whites of the eyes of the person who's doing it. And he said, and you haven't got any adverts. I said, well, I'm not having anyone pay me what to say. And so those was his advice. I didn't listen as I never do. <laughs> and I, it happened. But I think that speaks to that really intangible, but incredibly powerful force of trust. People trust you. So when I, we were researching this, I, I was struck by the, the Covey example of what trust means, which was reliability, credibility, and intimacy. People feel they know you. And that's then divided by the self-awareness of where you spend your time. Is it about making yourself rich or is it about helping other people? And I think you tick all of those boxes in an incredibly powerful way that for listeners, if we understand that trust can make you happier, it makes you more productive, it helps in relationships, I think it's a topic worth exploring, if you don't mind. So I sat at an energy summit run by David Cameron when energy prices were going up. Oh, if only they were going up where they were then now. Uh, you know, this is a fraction of what we have today. And one of the bosses of the big energy firms said, Prime Minister, we need your help. People don't trust us. And Therefore, we're not getting the information across that we need. And we need your help. And we need everybody in this room to make, help make sure that customers trust their energy firms. And David Cameron nodded and said, yes, yes, absolutely. We need to look at that. And I put my hand up at, and I was at the end of the room. I wasn't quite as big as I am now, if you know what I mean. I was at the end of the room, put my hand up and I was ignored and I kept my hand up and nothing came on and I kept my hand up. And then eventually he turned to me and he said, yes. And I said, I just want to say, having heard the call on trust, I will do everything I possibly can to ensure that nobody trusts you because you are not trustworthy. The latest data shows 56% or whatever it was of people who come to your call centers are given incorrect information. I will not tell people to trust you until you become trustworthy. For me, you cannot market trust. Trust only comes from being trustworthy. It only comes from a track record of doing the right thing or at least trying to do the right thing. And there is a differentiation between the two. As long as people are trying to do the right thing, that's good enough because, you know, th there's a perfection. And so, and actually, I do actually think energy companies have become more trustworthy since then because they've had to the way of regulation works and things that go on. They're charging way too much, but at least, I mean, I'm not saying they are trustworthy, but they've become more, it's all relative. In terms of when they say something to you, it now works in that way around. There's one thing that we all have in common. We're all wearing a whoop band. So here we are at the High Performance Half, the first ever run for High Performance here in East London. How important has the wood been in your, in your training and preparation for today? The thing that's really going to benefit me is the, is the sleep performance tracking. That's been huge. When I train, it tells my body what I can and can't do, so it gives me that information. I really looked at the recovery, so like yesterday I was thinking, oh, I hadn't really done many runs, and I thought, what's my recovery like? Should I do a, a, like a 5K yesterday? And I was like, if my recovery is kind of nearly 80 or whatever, then I'll do it. So I literally did a run yesterday because of the data on the bike, so. If you want to get the best out of yourself, it's essential. So if you want to find your own version of high performance, then we will help you on that journey. I think it's about you understanding at the kind of ebbs and flows of your body, and if you're interested in that, then it's perfect for everyone. It isn't about being an elite athlete, right? It's actually about being kinder to yourself. Just try it, and you, 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 you won't get it done. I've talked before about the fact that I have a professional paranoia, and to anybody starting out in an enterprise, I would really say this. I, I once did a talk for a friend with some young entrepreneurs and they were starting out. And uh, someone asked me about, you know, what shortcuts? And I went, whoa, 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 stop, stop. Shortcuts might help a small business to be a bigger business. But if you want to be a big business and you've taken shortcuts, you're going to kill yourself for future 
Because if you are throwing away that trust early, you have to be trustworthy from day one. Do not think that if you get really big in 20 years time, people aren't going to look back and say, but hold on, in the first year, didn't you do that? That's what you really are. So you have to do it right from the moment that you start if you're setting out to have you know, an entity or be trustworthy in that way. I have a massive professional paranoia to a ridiculous level that drives my team mad, drives me mad. And the best example I can give you, we had a deal with a telecoms provider once. It was best in market deal. It was a broadband firm. I won't give the firm, it's not fair to say. When we negotiate a voucher incentive to sign up for the site, it must always be one that is paid automatically or not claimed, or I won't have it. So we negotiated a voucher incentive for the site, but the company was also giving its own voucher, which was a standard deal for non-direct, so for going through any other site, which had another voucher which you had to claim. So you had a voucher you had to claim, and then you had the extra one on top we had negotiated that you didn't have to claim. Fine, we live with that, that's a standard term and condition. I then found out, because somebody told me, that the amount that we got paid if somebody clicked through us and didn't claim their voucher from the broadband firm, we'd get more. So we would be paid more money if people didn't claim their voucher, even though, of course, we go and tell people to claim voucher. And I said, we can't do the deal. And they said, what do you mean? And they said, you, you're not going to incentive, are you going to encourage people to class? I said, we can't do the deal. Uh, I do not want anybody thinking we have a perverse incentive. And even though over my dead body will we act in a way to discourage people from claiming their voucher, the fact, and they're like, nobody will know. It doesn't matter. Someone somewhere will know, and that is not right for us. Now, that rule still stands. I'm not saying at some point, because I don't vet every single deal that goes through, something like that hasn't gone through. But when I heard of it, it was a red line for me. And so actually, we, we just said, we won't take that extra money. And again, how, how did you come to this realisation that trust is almost the, that is the thing that Cause, people... Because I didn't set the website up to make money. Had no way of making money when I set it up in the right. first place. That was never what the intention was. I never said, I, you know, I get asked to do talks as an entrepreneur all the time. I rarely do it. And if I do, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. It just wasn't my goal. You know, and I think I'm, I am, my goal was to be a, a campaigning broadcast journalist, you know, and it, it came through the financial sector. That's what I do. You ask me, what do I do? I'm a journalist. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not a website owner. I'm not any of those things. I'm a journalist and I'm a campaigning journalist. That's who I am. So it, it, it's not that I went how do I manufacture to be the most trusted person out there? It's just that I'm a campaigning journalist and I act like a campaigning journalist and I try and be a party political, very political, but a party political. And those are, that paranoia, I, I hate people saying I've done something wrong. Nothing upsets me more when, than, than when someone questions my motives. I don't care if people call me a, the C word, right? But when someone questions, yeah, you're only doing this because you know, you've got a vested interest or something. I, I mean, that's what makes me see red. And the nature of the site on, and the nature of your work now, as you say about the, uh, the, the campaigning, is very much around what I see about righting wrongs. And I'm interested in going back to that early age where you noticed inequality around you, partly because of the school that you grew up in. Yeah, so I, I, I rather bizarrely grew up in a special education school because um, my father was the headmaster and it was a boarding school and we lived on top of it. So I, I did learn at a very early age privilege, you know, the, the, the privilege that I had to have good mental capacity uh, and to be able to learn and not to struggle. Um, you know, I, I, I remember crying at the age of 15. I, I won't mention the individual's name because it's not fair. There was a boy who had spent three years learning to tie his shoelaces. He had a severe restricted mental capacity and he tied his shoelaces and I was there the first time he did it. And I think there are very few people in this world who will climb a mountain that high, right? I mean, I, I, I could still feel it now. And, and, and that, you know, that, that, you want a definition of high performance? That individual, three years to tie his own shoelaces and the day he did it, he just went, yes! 
and and most of us who were there who were who were not one of the, you know our eyes went as my eyes are going now at the memory of it so that's high performance and high performance is is always an individual thing what you're prepared to do and it's based on your aptitude your capacity and how much you want to do so so yeah growing up in that environment taught me a lot as i say about privilege and the birth look that i'd been born with that I didn't have to struggle to learn to tie my shoelaces. You know, I could never learn to play the piano. I wasn't born with that gift, but tying my shoelaces was fine and other things were fine. I wasn't a consumer campaigner when I first started uh, the money saving stuff. When I first started Money Saving Expert, my view was, I, and we actually had a, uh, we had a car sticker that said it, you know, a company's job is to screw you, our job is to screw them back. That, it was really adversarial. And is that what you've really felt? You know, companies spend billions of pounds on advertising and marketing and teaching their staff to sell. And consumers get no buyer's training and no financial education, and it's an imbalanced market. So actually, a little bit of aggression from consumers, never personal aggression, I don't mean it in, in, in a bad way, but instead of saying, no, I'm not going to let them do that to me. I'm, I'm going to find... I mean, there was one bank account, I think it was Barclays. It was a terrible bank account, but they were paying people a 100 quid to sign up for a bit, even if you didn't switch properly. Because this was before they put in all the criteria that stops me doing things like this. So I put in my email, and this was in the early days before we hit a million people, but it's still pretty big. I said, everybody go and do this. And we closed that bank account in three hours, which meant all the people who it wasn't a good bank account for didn't get it, but everyone got the 100 quid. You know, and that was, that, that was the use of, of the information to, to go there. Then I had a shift, and the shift came, I met a friend of a friend who was a mental health caseworker who told me they love my website. I said, I don't use it for me, I use it for my clients. And that was a bit of an epiphany moment. In the early days, my view was, look, some, if you do this and you succeed, you win, and if you don't, that's your problem, you lose, and, and you'll get ripped off. And that's a, that, I have a very different view on that now, with you know, one in four people in the country having a mental health problem at some point in a life and people who have mental capacity issues, you know, and, and stress because you've had a new baby or the onset of dementia, or you're just, you know, work is really hard at the moment, or, or you've just suffered a breakdown. And there are all those moments in all of our lives where we're not as capable as we usually are. And actually, I'm now a, a much greater believer that there has to be systemic change to protect people rather than just relying on some individuals to protect themselves. And that's been a, that's been a shift since probably about 2000 when I first started. How did we end up in this position then where society is kind of stacked against people in, in so many ways? Like we have to be, rely on people like you and be really agile and really smart not to sort of get turned over. I think, I think we've always, it's always been like that. Right. I think we're just more aware of it now. And I think some of that is the de democratization that the internet brought. I think the internet was incredible for ena enabling people to look up instant resources and find out information about what they want. Uh, I mean, it's been an incredible force for good as well as a force for bad, the, the internet out there. And I, and I do think that that awareness, you know, you had programs like That's Life, which were consumer empowerment. You had Watchdog, which I was a big fan of, and I you know, think it's an absolute tragedy that the BBC, uh, you know, our public service broadcaster, has reduced that to a concession on the one show. I mean, I think it's a disgrace in the, in, in, during the cost of living crisis that, that there is now no mainstream consumer programme that is in primetime BBC. There is on ITV, but there isn't on BBC. And I would love the competition. And, and it always did something different. Watchdog curative. It looks at people who've had problems. I'm preventative. My whole aim is to try and prevent the problems in the first place or get redress when they have happened. When there is injustice by design and it's bred into the system and they're doing it full knowledge, that's when I kick into action. And that's when it's a story. You know, at the moment I'm working on motor finance uh, reclaiming, which is going to be the next big thing. And that's all about discretionary commissions where lenders said to car dealers, if you want more commission, you can just put the interest rate up. Uh, and they did, but they didn't tell people about the discretionary commission. And now there's a massive investigation by the regulator. And I think people are going to get large amounts of money back. Anyone who bought a car or a van or other forms of motor vehicles on finance before 2021. That's going to be, over the next year, the big thing that's coming out, and there's going to be billions of pounds paid back. Systemic, deliberate. You know, PPI, £40 billion. Systemic, scripted, mis-selling to rip off the most vulnerable in society. Deliberate. Deliberate, calculated, selling people a near-worthless product 
doing through scripted, very clever mis-selling, not even telling people they got the product, saying when people ask for a loan, you'd be told, yes, you're fully insured loan. And the fully insured meant we're selling you a second product on top. That's actually where all the profit is. And we're not even breaking out the fact we're selling you a second product on top. And that's why £40 billion was paid back on that. Though That's where I like to kick off. Human error neck. But then yeah. when we hear the passion in your voice around uh, like the anger at that kind of systemic injustice. I'm interested in the source of it for you, of what ignites that anger to want to put yourself out there and challenge the system. I think sometimes when you understand it, you know, when you, when you steep yourself in it and live and breathe, and you know that the people who design these systems are also steeped in it, and then you just think, you bastards, you've deliberately deliberately done something to profiteer and you're taking that off many people whose lives are going to have a much worse impact i, I am i'm not anti-capitalist you know i i believe in making money i believe in entrepreneurship i believe in all of those things but i think you you want you want to be able to sleep at night so when I did bank charge reclaiming, which we got a billion pounds back, which was like the predecessor to PPI reclaiming, which was even bigger. And in the early days of both of those, they were running simultaneously. And I did template letters at the time rather than the tools we use now. I think we did six million template letters for bank charges and, and more on PPI. I mean, enormous numbers. And I met someone later who worked for a debt charity. Uh, so I probably met them in about 2010, 2011. And they said they had worked at the banks in the early days of my bank charges and PPI template letters. And what she said to me that was fascinating, she said, do you know that about 20% of your letters, and they know what mine are, about 20% of your letters, where it says your name, your address, your details, people would leave that in. They wouldn't delete the your name, your address, your details. And 5% of your letters, people would just send their le the letter in without adding their details. So people would post a template letter, they'd print it off the site, They'd say your name, your address, nothing personal, your case, and they'd post it. And I find that one of the most fundamentally depressing things of my entire career. So here we are with Britain's biggest financial institutions, having deliberately, systemically, and no one's gone to prison for it, no one's been prosecuted criminally for it, deliberately, systemically ripped millions of everyday people off who were already needing to borrow at that time. And 5% of the people who had those products who were trying to get their money back had such limited mental capacity or functional literacy that they did not understand that they needed to put their details in a template letter. I mean, that is criminal. That is criminal. And you sit there going, well, someone, someone has to do something. Someone, you know, when I remember the later days of PPI, alongside which we negotiated to make sure that when they were putting a close on it, the FCA made sure the firms put money in to help the vulnerable people claim because it's just too difficult for some people. But I mean, I don't know about you, but I find that just, that is a tragedy. Yeah, and, and we have to, you know, I talk about lots of things. You know, I talk about energy. We don't have a social tariff in this country, right? Now, I'm a great supporter of a social tariff. What that does, it said, look, we've gone for a competitive model. We've gone for a model of market competition where energy switching should make it cheaper. Now, without being rude to you two chaps, if you could save 20% on your energy bill and you had to take action and you two didn't, well, that's your problem. You're both perfectly capable of doing it. But when a struggling 90-year-old grandmother with onset dementia is paying the maximum for her energy bills because she can't access the system and doesn't understand what to do, and therefore she pays more to boil a kettle than I do, that is all of our problem. That is society's problem. And the, the easier, you know, the, the finances and the surface of my life gets, the more I feel the injustice for people who are going the other way around. So I think, there's a, I think that's probably the correlatory relationship. It's very interesting you feel like that, though, because most people feel more content, happier, more relaxed if they've got a few a bob in the bank and they've been perceived as successful by the outside world. It's very interesting that your, your emotion is quite different. I... Look, having money in the bank is great. It doesn't make you happy, but it certainly takes away many of the negatives and it gives you a safety net and, and it enables you to look after you, those that you love. And that's incredibly important. Uh, so it's not about the money so much. I, I, you know, it's, it's probably a weird bit of me fighting that, that there's an injustice that people can be as wealthy as me in the world. 
Right. Right. But I mean, I'm very glad I am. Mm. I'm not saying I'm not saying not. And, and it, it's what means that I choose what I do. I don't have to work. I never have to work a day again in my life. So nothing I do anymore has anything to do with because I need to go and make money. Um, I, I choose what, what I do and why I do. And that's the greatest luxury and the greatest freedom that you can possibly have. You know, that your life is your control. And interestingly, I do tend to think most people who've made a lot of money tend to be the ones who won't stop work because they're driven. So yeah. there's a virtuous circle going on there. I think some of the guilt comes because, you know, I remember in the pandemic, then my head on my desk crying, you know, <laughs> weeks on end at the messages that were coming in and the, the desperation at people's lives. Um, and there'll be people sitting out there and I go, why don't you just give them money? Because it doesn't work. Because no matter how much money you've got, it takes you five minutes, it'll all be gone. I put money into charities and organizations to try and help and I work it that way. You know, my big charity, my money and mental health charity is all about trying to change the system to improve people's lives. Direct handouts to a few individuals, you know, is just spitting in the sea, it's nothing. So, but I do feel when you're reading that and because I'm the money saving expert, because I'm steeped with dealing with people's financial issues and I don't have them myself, I think that that helps drive some of the guilt that comes from it. When I sold the website and, you know, I still in charge of all the content and the strategy, people think I'm, I'm still there, still drive them all mad every day um, uh, as executive chair these days. But when I sold it and I was going to be publicly rich, and I, I phrase that quite deliberately yeah. because, I mean, I had an asset worth many millions of pounds and I crystallized that asset, de-risked and then had cash of the same amount. I wasn't any richer the next day, I just had it in a different asset class. And the site had already been very profitable beforehand. So I was already, you know, doing very well financially. Yep. But the knowledge, because I'd grown up, I hadn't, I don't come from a rich background in any way, the knowledge I was publicly going to be very wealthy. And I was worried what people would say, you know, I was torn between, would I have a reaction from people that, great, I want the guy who talks to me about what to do with my money to have done really well with his money, or are they going to say, well, how can he? How can he have any clue about our lives? And it makes me laugh these days because I'll get people who talk about, but they'll talk to me about politics. Oh, you get it, Martin. But then Rishi Sunak or whatever else with all their millions in the bank and they, you know, yeah, yeah. how can they ever understand it? And I go, well, it doesn't preclude you from understanding it. It doesn't preclude you as long as you work hard and you care, you know, and, and you also gives you the ability to put money into trying to help people, that which I do both in my day job and in my charity funds. Was there ever a moment where someone came to you and said, look, you can make three times the money on this website by doing this? Yeah, loads. I mean, people talk about when I sold, I refused, I, you know, and, and I sold not to make money, which will, and people say, yeah, of course you did. I didn't, I didn't, it, the pressure was too big. I couldn't run it. I couldn't control it. I wanted to focus on what I was doing. I wanted to de-risk. So that was, that was probably the biggest financial incentive with de-risking as opposed to making money. It was a de-risk, but also, I mean, it was just too much. I couldn't cope. My mental health was struggling from it. I just needed to get some of the pressure away. And, and selling was incredibly pressured, but I went to a corporate finance advisor, which is what you do in these circumstances. I you know he wanted to do a beauty parade. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not interested in selling anybody who sells products. I'm not interested in selling anybody who's got products and a parent down the line. I want somebody who will sign up to my editorial code, which is effectively an ethical charter that says money saving expert. And it's still, as long as I'm there, it's still valid and still legally bound. will always do what's in its user's interest first ahead of its own financial concerns. We will never data mine. We will always be free to talk even about the parent entity. And all of those things were in my, in my absolute red lines for sale. We only had one buyer because all the others, and some of them, you know, the, the talk was four or five times what I got. And I got a lot of money, and four or five times a lot of money is a shed load of money. But that, I, I, that was, I didn't want to know. When he said, do you want, I was like, don't tell me. Don't tell me how much they want to give, because I'm not interested. But can we I did, I, well, I was interested, but I felt I didn't want to know, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But can we explore the topic there that you said about the weight of responsibility that you bore? Because I'm interested in, that trust element that we spoke about, as you grew the business and you started to have to trust other people to have the similar ethics and the similar drive and, 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 and desire for red lines that you had, how did you learn to do that, to cascade the idea that, that it's your reputation that you're putting in other people's hands? 
I tell you what, very interesting. Uh, uh, one of my former senior staff who came from a very commercial place. It's not as difficult as you think, actually. Okay. Uh, and I think this is probably more important. His lessons more important than mine. I I want MSE and the work I do to be trusted because that's my core belief set. Right. So which is pretty inarguable. That's what I believe in. That's why I do it. That's that's what it's about. Simple. And I want it to be very successful financially as well. Core belief set. Do the right thing. So a hard guy came in very senior. I'm not sure he'd want me to mention his name, so I won't do it. But he came in from a very commercial place and he was very senior in the organization. And we talked after he'd been in two or three months. And I said, look, you need to understand that my most important thing is we always do what is right. We always do what is right for our users and we must protect that above everything. And I was expecting this hugely vor voraciously commercial person. He said, well, my view, is we must always do what is right for our users ahead of anything else. He said, because our biggest financial asset is the trust that people have in the site. And therefore we cannot, we cannot do anything that breaches that. So from his purely commercial perspective, his idea was that for longevity, of the brand, I hate thinking of the brand, but the longevity of the brand and the organization and the site, he came to the same conclusion as me. And we worked incredibly well together because we had a, this really shared aim, even though we had entirely different belief sets which were driving us to it. So that was never that difficult on the trust. I mean, the stress basis, the responsibility is, I mean, I find it very difficult. I'm always very careful how I talk about my mental health, so I don't go into my mental health in detail. Um, but often I'm very well, and then I have periods where I'm not very well. And one of the first periods where I wasn't very well, in fact, the first period where I wasn't very well, was actually coincided with bank charges that we talked about earlier. And I had three people in a week call me a god. And they came on the tube. Oh, you're a god to me. I do everything you say. I've got everything back from bank charges. And it, it broke me. This is when you talk about the compliments, but it absolutely broke me. I just, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. They kept saying, you're a god. I do whatever you say. I, was, I couldn't cope with it. I, I, and I know it sounds, it's just, it's a lot of pressure to throw on somebody. These people you've never met, you know nothing about, and I want to do the right thing. And you're going, but you're not even telling me. I read everything and I made my decision. You're just telling me I'd do it. And I'm always about empowering. In my, in my head, I try and empower people to give them the information and guidance to make the right decision. But I don't want to make that decision for them. The pandemic was very difficult and, and coming out in the cost of living crisis, they were very difficult for that reason. You just, I mean, the number of people, the phrases, you know, killer phrases. I'm re I rely on, every, on you. I do everything you say. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I find it, I, I hope there's not an arrogance in, in me saying it, but I find that so difficult. And then I go through everything I've done wrong in my life, because I'm a human being, I've done lots of things wrong. I mean, nothing, what, you know, but lots of things I feel guilty about. I remember the person I was really shitty to at university, right? And I just think, oh God, that was a horrible thing I did to that person. I remember this and that. And I thought, oh my God, well, that, they're going to start talking about it. And, and everyone, you know, so the more people put you up on a pedestal, the more you think, oh God, they're just going to not, you know, something's going to happen that breaks that. And I don't want to break that trust because what I do, I think is really important. And I would, you know, I wish, and the bigger you I've got, the more difficult that is. So there is an incredible pressure. And I, and it, I find it, well, that struggle to difficult with it is an under-exaggeration. I can't deal with it at times. I can't so, deal with it at times. So would you share with us though, because I think there's lots of people listening to this will feel pressure in different guises, however it shows up. Would you tell us some of the methods you have learned of coping under pressure? I've been asked that question before. And honestly, no, I won't, because I'm crap at it, right? And I don't want anybody to learn from me. I do what I can. Well, what about your biggest mistakes then? Uh, look, I, um, I try and learn the breathing stuff. I'm not very, I, I try my breathing. I, I can't do meditation, right? I mean, uh, sleeping is quite tough. All of those things. I try and talk myself through it. I've had therapy. I've done all of those things. But when, when it's bad, it's bad. I, my main coping mechanisms Huge amounts of exercise, lots of walking on top of the exercise. Um, always be in a book. That's one of my yeah. big rules. So for me, it has to be, I only have two types of books. 
it must be either science fiction or fantasy or historic fiction. It cannot be anything that could trigger thoughts about my world and I must always be in a book. What I mean by that is if I'm struggling and I'm stressed, I can't start a book. So my rule is at any one time, I must be in a book that I'm enjoying because then if I'm struggling and stressed, I can stay in it. So whenever I finish a book, I always get into another book absolutely as a priority. So I'm always in the middle of a book. That's that one of the few tips that works and find distraction, find anything that can take your brain away. I don't care if it's playing a game on your phone, which is something I do. I'll find a game that will buzz your brain, but distraction is very important. But the problem with that is that's personal to what I deal with. You know, some people have depression. I don't have depression. Mine is anxiety based. I have anxiety. And we all need to find our own different things. I, I, I've been to universities and I've done talks on how to be successful. And one of the, you know, I, I say there are four things. Talent, but I think a lot more people have talent than they know. Um, hard work and all those people who say, oh, I only do four hours a day and I've been really successful. I just think it's bullshit. I think most people are really successful work really hard. I mean, I spent a decade working 90 hours a week. Yeah. You know, that was, that was just what I did. That's how I got here. When I was building the website myself, that was what I was doing. Focus, I think, is incredibly important. Laser-like focus. You can't be the best at everything. Try and be the best at one thing. And then the final one I say, which is absolutely, unquestionably the most important one. Luck. And anyone tells you there isn't an element in luck in what they do, is, again, is just lying to you. There were, you know, and there's all the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. No, well, it's not true. There are lots of incredibly hardworking, talented, focused people who have not been successful. And that's another reason for the whole pay it back, because I am aware I've been incredibly lucky. But the, the tip that I need to say within all that is, do you really want to be that successful? Because there's a cost to it. There's a cost to pushing as hard as I've pushed and as hard as other people have pushed. And I look at some of my incredibly bright contemporaries from university who haven't on paper been as successful as I have. And who perhaps, you know, everybody when we were leaving, I was at the LSE, there were lots of people who were really driven there. Everyone as we were leaving thought they really wanted to be successful. And there were many who within probably three or four years suddenly went, actually, I can be make a good income and I can work nine to five and get a good income and I can have a nice life afterwards and that's all gonna, and that's pretty good for me. I'm not sure I wanna push it. And I was there going, <laughs> zone, zone, zone. I think in balance at the age of 51, if I were to compare myself to some of them, I think if you add up the total happiness that each of them have had, they're ahead on the happiness score. So I think people need to, how hard, how hard do you want to push? How much do you really want to be the number one in, in what you do on the big picture? Not, most people can't be, so a lot of people will fail. And even if you do get it, I'm sure there are some people you'll have met who've had great journeys to, to top level success and high performance and never, haven't had to pay for it. But I, I've certainly paid for it in quite a lot of ways. In, you know, you locking yourself away doing spreadsheets for, for many hours when other people weren't, missing out on social life, missing out on interactions with family, certainly my 30s in the drive stage of my career, and the impact it's had on my mental health with the responsibility that's come with it. I'm not asking anyone to be sorry, feel sorry for me. I just mm. think it's a choice thing. I also think it's a really important thing to talk about because we're a podcast that tries to peel back the layers to reveal the truth. There are plenty of other podcasts and social media platforms telling young people work 24 hours a day, don't take a break, be relentless, have the hustle, you know, do something on the side, push yourself to the limit, work up, be the hardest worker in the room. And I think it never takes into account luck. And then it leaves us in a position where there are people saying, well, I've done all those things and I still haven't achieved anything. And then it actually leaves people feeling far worse than feeling better. It's not a, it's not a form of empowerment to tell everyone else that it worked for me. It's a form of empowerment, as you're saying, to say that actually this comes at a price. It does, I, and I can only talk from my experience. I'm not saying it will be that way for everyone. I'm sure there are some people who've made that path through. Mm. But most people I meet who've been successful have had real sacrifice for doing it. And, and actually, you know, you need to just make that choice of whether that's right for you. And I, you know, happiness, I don't think there's enough focus on happiness as a form of success. So when you look back at you leaving LSE with yeah. that peer group you described, did you consciously decide that you were going to sacrifice happiness to go after this? And I'm interested in if you were to go back there then. I was incredibly driven at that point. 
I mean, people who went to university with me, some of them I'm sure will say I was unbearable while I was at university. So I, um, I left school. I was, I was relatively shy and quiet at school. Um, I, you know, I had never been diagnosed this, but I, I was post-traumatic stress for, for many years. I, you know, I didn't, never left the home really until I was 18. Right. So I didn't go out, didn't go to party. Never Did been you to have help? And no, it was, no, just, no. It was the 80s. Not in the, no. <laughs> it was the 80s, you know. I, I went back to school after my mum had been killed and nobody said a word to me. It was the 80s, you know. So I, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't leave the house because I hadn't been in the house when she was killed. So, um, uh, so no, I didn't. And I, I had no life. I had no teenage years until I was 18. Nothing. I mean, I, can't you, I, this is not an exaggeration. I think I, I went, I, well, I'll tell you, just so you, it's worth saying, the story. The, the story. And I saw, I um, never been to a party. I'd always made excuses why I was busy and I wasn't. I was sitting at home. Cause I couldn't, and I got to about 17 and I was just coming out of my shell uh, and, and thinking, actually, I want to go and socialise and be with people. And uh, I got invited to a party by a girl I shared the bus with and who, you know, and she said, why don't you come? And I, you know, you know, you'll know people. So I really wanted to go to her party. And then I thought, what do you wear to a party? I'm 17. I, I'm like, I don't know. Am I meant to wear a suit? Am I meant to wear jeans? I just, it sounds, I did not know because I had never been because since since two days before I was 12, I had not been anywhere. And I didn't know. And my sister wasn't living at home and I didn't trust my father and my stepmother, right? I didn't think they would know because you know, I'm 17 and think, oh, you won't know. And, and they were like, we'll drive you, let us know what to, because clearly I'm not in a good place uh, as I look back on it now. And I bottled it, didn't go, couldn't go, I was too scared. So I, when I was 18, I mean, I really, really had no experience of anything other than going to school and being depressed, right? Not clinical depression, depression, causal depression. And so I left at 18 and then I had this sort of eclectic year where I, I went to Camp America and worked on a summer camp, uh, uh, which was pretty hard. I was incredibly homesick until the last couple of weeks. I had this wonderful moment in a pantomime they did where I was meant to be the backstage sound guy and the, the, one of the women from the camp who was going to be playing the fairy godmother wasn't there. This was a week to go. And they said, could you just read her lines? And I was very shy and, and I'm still very shy. I'm just now a performer. There's a difference. And, I, and they asked, said, will you read her lines? And I went, I said, okay, I'll read the lines. And something broke in me. And instead of going staccato, so I said, I went, poof. And I came out and I performed it. And they're falling, everyone was falling around laughing and they said, Will you do that tomorrow? Will you do it? So I went, okay. I'd never been on stage before, never done anything like that. And, and I did that and I just thought, wow. And then I worked as a VDU operator with a, a, a lovely group of graduates who took me out to pubs and nightclubs for my first time. I mean, I didn't know what you did in the pub. Yeah. So I had, and I was quite honest with them, which I wouldn't have been with my school friends. And they took me out and said, well, come with us. And then I worked, um, then I worked as a salesman, which is, I mean, I think anyone who wants to work in business should have to do compulsory service as a salesman. I think it should be mandated. What were you selling? A caravan awnings. Doesn't matter what you're selling, you're selling, right? And it was all about learning to communicate, incredible communications lesson. And uh, just before that, I'd worked as a, in a bar to learn more about, so I worked in a bar. And then I went back to Camp America, second time with a totally different confidence level, became head of staff entertainment, doing shows all the time, doing that type of stuff. Wow. And then I turned up at university and I'd flipped like a pancake. So from having been this shy person who'd never been out, I was flooded with this exuberance and confidence I would say bordering on arrogance, but it wasn't bordering, it was just arrogance, right? And I could do anything. And first week of university, I put myself up to be rag chair of the uni and I got it. And I put myself up to be up to three other posts. So I had three posts within my first week at university, you know, and I was into the student politics. And by the end, I was student president and I was, you know, the loudest and, and you know, overbearing person in the university. I mean, I cared about what I did. I loved what I did, but boy, was, was I out there. And so I was a, it was a very different phrase, but the, the flip like a pancake is the best way I can describe it. But you aren't kind enough to yourself, right? And that's obvious the way that you sort of talk and little things that you say. When you talk about being arrogant at university, 
But I sit here listening to that harrowing story of the previous years and think, oh my God, you deserved to be that person Maybe. at university. Maybe. You were making up for lost knew time. It. Nobody knew it. Yeah, but we now know it, don't we? Mm. So you can actually look back on that now and go, yes, I was out there. Yes, I was loud. Yes, I was brash. Yes, my voice was heard. Yes, I impacted the people around me. Because you'd spent five years not leaving your house. Like, no. That was the... That was the moment. Like you deserve that much. It stayed with me. The best example I can give you, because you should always have have some colour for this. My, this was slightly later when I went to do my broadcast journalism post grad, and again, I'd been president of my uni at this point, and I'd I'd been quite successful, so I had some more confidence. But I was still on that absolute, you know, nothing can touch yeah. me phase. Was we went and, and my friend Kerry tells this story, and they all laugh at me. All the people who did my course, who were still many of my great friends. So we went on the course, and it's a broadcast journalism course. And we're amongst all the journalists are signing up. There's about two, three hundred people in the room. And we're going, and, and it's just a sign up day. The course starts the next day. So I said to I met one of the other person who signed up saying, I said, it's a shame we can't all go and meet each other, isn't it? And he said, yeah, but I mean, how are we meant to know it? There's no mobiles or WhatsApp or anything like that at this time. Well, I think we had the word mobiles, but there's no, no community. And he said, how are we meant to do it? I said, oh, it's fine. I stood up. I said, Everybody on the broadcast course, with, I have a very loud voice, I'm not doing Everybody on the broadcast course, in 30 minutes we're going, and I name the local pub, we will be there, we'll see you there, so we can all beat before the start of the course. And just everyone stopped and looked. Brilliant. And they went, and they all go, how did you do that? I mean, obviously it's easy. And how many people turned up? Everyone. There you go. There are loads of lovely things for people to think about on this conversation. I mean, I think one of them is that we're not fixed. You know, there will be people listening to this who are maybe more towards the broken than the, than the okay place, right? And I think it's important for them to, to hear your story and to understand that it, it, things don't last forever necessarily and that you can not necessarily fully recover, but you can get back to a place of happiness. Well, more so than that. And, you know, I'm, I'm a patron of a uh, bereavement charity for young children and I've unfortunately had seen children who are the, the children of some friends of mine who've had lost their parents very sadly and one of my messages now when I look back at what happened to me I mean apart from the fact get counselling well for heaven's sake get counselling have someone to talk about there are great techniques for dealing with grief you know nothing will fix it but they will enable you, enable you to handle it better um, but a lesson I have for anyone with grief at any age is do not tell yourself off for smiling. I cannot tell you enough. You know, you lose someone yesterday, you've had the biggest tragedy in the life. If something happens that makes you smile, the reaction on that day is to stop yourself because I shouldn't be smiling. Screw that, My, screw that. The, the, the most important thing, you know, as someone who went through childhood trauma, the most important thing is grab every smile you can. Grab every, and if it comes, do not fight your smiles down. Do not ever try and make yourself less happy than you could be. And do not feel guilty about being happy. I mean, make sure it's appropriate if there's somebody else there who's in, having a different moment, but don't fight your smiles down. And if I could go back and tell that hideously hurt young boy anything, it was like, just go and try and be happy. You know, don't feel, and I did, I felt my responsibility was to, to mourn and be miserable. And I think we need to change our attitudes and we need to be open and we need to talk. I'll give you one final story if you like. And when I worked on the summer camp, and I'm Jewish and it was a Jewish summer camp, I worked on the summer camp and ugh, unbelievably, there was a little boy in the division that I was working on. This is the, the next year I went and I was a senior counsellor and um, we got a call, my, the division head and I, and that we were told that unfortunately, um, his mother had just passed away of cancer and his father had passed away the year before. And the new parents, and he, he was, uh, he was 11, nearly 12, which is exactly the same age as me. And myself and Keith, who was the division head, they said, one of you needs, because of the way the, the, the rules, one of you needs to be with when he's told and one of you needs to pack for him. So we tossed a coin for it and I won, I got to pack. Right, which I was very grateful for. So pack for him. Um, and... We packed him away and then he came back to the camp a week later. Then the next thing, on the, on the Friday night, they did this very low-end religious service and uh, the rabbi who was taking the service said, now some of you will know that this boy has come back, you know, and said his name. 
every eye, and there's 400 kids there, turns to him. And I'd all like to stand up and do it. It's an 11 year old boy and, and be silent. And I, I was sat near him and I saw his face just crumple. And I got a wave of anger. I just walked over and I picked him up, picked him up, carried him and just walked him out of there. And, and you know, and I, you know, I apologized to, to the rabbi later who was fine with it, finally realized. And I just, I said, the last thing he needed was 400 people pointing at him. You know, I had nobody talk to me, but nor do you want to be standing up and say, oh, there's a boy who's, who's now an orphan, mm. which is effectively what was said. And, attacked, and we just went and sat and chat, chatted. So, you know, smile when you can. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing so much with us. Look, you started this conversation saying... You, You've gone as well. <laughs> I have gone, yeah, about five times so far. Um, um, I, do, I do think, though, you know, this podcast is called High Performance, and I think sometimes people come to it for serious life lessons and how do I better myself. I think sometimes just v open, honest vulnerability is actually what high performance is, and I think you are a, you are a perfect example of of someone who's willing to sit and share as much as you have, because I think it is really valuable for other people. Thank and, you for um, having me. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. <laughs>